Connect to North at Home friends, this is Bruce Markelson and he works at a really cool place called the Baseball Hall of Fame. I think there's some moms and dads watching with us today, Bruce, who are huge baseball fans. So they're going to be helping their students and we told them that they just might need a pencil and a piece of paper to do some quick calculations. But you're going to give us a little tour of the of the Baseball Hall of Fame and then tell us how we use math in baseball and I believe this will be like a really like rookie level. Okay. Yep. Okay, so over how to long you. How long to uh, go with the program? Uh, about 35 minutes. Okay. Well, I'll okay. get as much done as I can in that time. Okay, but they're really interested in seeing this Okay. I can't hear you for the moment. I don't know why. Yeah, you'll you'll be surprised at what they already know about baseball. So over to you, Bruce. All right. Thank you very much, Molly. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our program. We're actually not at the Hall of Fame because the building is closed because of what's been going on lately. Uh, hopefully that'll change in the coming weeks. But I'm broadcasting um, just a few miles from the Hall of Fame at my home, which is in Cooperstown. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for being with us. We'll start with a virtual tour of the museum, and then we'll get into the math portion of the program. But you should see right now on your screen a picture of the Hall of Fame from right out front on Main Street. It's a beautiful three-story red brick building full of exhibits about baseball and the game's history. Lots of things here. In addition to the exhibits, we have a couple of theaters. We also have a library. Where are we geographically? Well, we're in the United States. We're in the Northeastern part. So here's a map of the Northeast part of the US. You can see states like Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, and then the state that I'm in, which is in New York. There's a reddish arrow pointing at the Hall of Fame logo. And that is where Cooperstown is. So Cooperstown is in central New York or upstate New York. We're about four hours from New York City, probably about four hours from Buffalo, New York, probably about four hours from Toronto as well. It seems like we're four hours from all these major cities. We are not a city, though. We are very rural. We are very much the country. There you can see beautiful Lake Otsego. Cooperstown sits on the southern shore of the lake, lots of trees, rolling hills. Uh, open fields, no skyscrapers. Our tallest building is all of five stories. So we're very much a rural village in upstate New York. We have a small population here. Only 1,800 people live here on a year-round basis, so not even 2,000. And that's why we have exactly one traffic light. There you see it at the corner of Main and Chestnut Street. That's it, one traffic light in our small town. Now, during the summer, we normally get very large crowds. We have events that take place at Doubleday Field. You see that in the top half of your screen. Doubleday Field is an historic ballpark. It's actually celebrating its 100th anniversary. Right now, it's undergoing some final renovations before it does reopen for the summer. I'm told it looks beautiful. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but they've done some really nice work there. And when it is done and reopened, it'll fit about 10,000 fans. The bottom of your screen, bottom right, is a picture from our annual induction ceremony. Um, and this is an event that unfortunately we had to cancel because of the coronavirus. Uh, just felt it was too dangerous to have an event like this with tens of thousands of people. So we canceled it, we postponed it till next year. What we're going to do is we're going to combine this year's induction class, which includes Derek Jeter, with whoever might be elected in 2021. So we'll have kind of two classes of Hall of Famers celebrated next July 2021. This is the biggest crowd we've ever had in Cooperstown. This is back 2007 when two really popular players, Cal Ripken Jr. and Tony Gwynn, uh, were both inducted. This is an overhead photograph, and what you're seeing here is about 80,000 fans. That's the biggest crowd. That's the record for Cooperstown 
So 80,000 fans is about 40 times our normal population. Let's go inside the museum. Here we have a plaque gallery. Uh, this is where we feature the 329 bronze plaques that represent each of our Hall of Fame members. Basically, these are the greatest players, managers, umpires, owners in the history of baseball. Only the best of the best of the best are represented here in Cooperstown. Now, as we go up to the second floor of the museum, one of the first exhibits you would see up there is Taking the Field Baseball Before 1900, which examines the origins of the game. Baseball is a very old sport. We have found references to baseball here in the United States back in the 1790s. It was really not until the 1800s that the game started to become popular and a big part of American culture. Here is maybe the most popular player in baseball history. We have an entire exhibit dedicated to Babe Ruth. It's called Babe Ruth, His Life and Legend. You can see his number three New York Yankee uniform. At first, he was a great pitcher for the Boston Red Sox. And then the Yankees made him a full-time outfielder. And he became this just phenomenal slugging outfielder. Had the home run record for many, many years until it was broken. And he's an internationally known figure. Even in countries where baseball is not that popular, many people have heard of the great Babe Ruth. One of our most important exhibits is Pride and Passion. It is all about the history of African Americans who have played the game of baseball. Unfortunately, for quite a long period of time, um, baseball was a segregated sport. Only white players were allowed in the major leagues uh, going back to the late 1800s up until 1947. And that's when Jackie Robinson, whom you see here, broke through the color barrier. And he did so well that he opened the door for other African-American players. Now here's something interesting. Jackie actually played a season in Canada. He played for the Montreal Royals. They were the minor league AAA team for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, so he played one year, really enjoyed it in Montreal before ultimately getting a chance to break the color barrier in the majors in 1947. Now, I'm not able to see any of the students, but I imagine we have some girls that are joining us today as part of the program. We have an exhibit here about girls and women in baseball called Diamond Ring. It's a very popular exhibit. Uh, it's all about the history of young ladies who have played the game over time. Women have been playing baseball, organized baseball, since the 1860s, so almost as long as the men have been playing. Uh, in this exhibit, we talk about the Bloomer Girls teams of the early 20th century. We also talk about uh, the uh, All-American Girls League, which sprang during World War II. Uh, more recently, we talk about... Um, Players uh, like Maria Pepe, a Little League player. Uh, she was not allowed to play Little League in the early 1970s, but she took Little League to court and won the right for girls to be able to play Little League baseball. Uh, more recently, there have been uh, teams like the Colorado Silver Bullets featuring women players. So all of these stories are told in Diamond Dream. Shoebox Treasures, our newest exhibit, it's up on the third floor, and this is where we feature the history of baseball cards and baseball card collecting. Some of you may be card collectors. So we look at this hobby, the history of, of cards, which goes all the way back to the 1800s. And then up on the third floor as well, we have this exhibit, one for the books. It is all about baseball records and the stories behind them. And that ties in very well with our subject matter today, which is baseball and math. We are going to look at baseball as a game of numbers. The numbers tell us the story of what has happened. Here we have a scoreboard, Fenway Park, Boston, home of the Red Sox. Now, let's say I get lost in traffic going to the ballpark, and I don't get to Fenway Park until the sixth inning. 
What's the best way to catch up on what I've missed? Well, the best thing to do is to look at the scoreboard. That gives you the essentials. I see the Yankees have scored 13 runs. The Red Sox have scored only two. Red Sox are in the field, so the Yankees must be at bat. Batting for the Yankees is number 21. The count on him is three balls and two strikes. So in just a matter of seconds, by looking at the scoreboard, I kind of caught myself up with where we are in the game. And the numbers do tell that story. Numbers also help us identify the players. Players can actually wear any number from zero up to 99, double digits allowed, but 100 and above not allowed. They do not allow triple digit uniforms in baseball. Here we have images of three very famous players. We've talked a little bit about Babe Ruth already. Then we have Hank Aaron. And then we have Barry Bonds. Now, next to each player, I am going to put a number. For Ruth, it's 714. For Aaron, it's 755. And for Bonds, it is 762. So I'm going to ask a question here. What do you think these numbers signify? These are not just random numbers that I picked out of a hat. These are numbers that mean something, that signify something. What do you think the numbers might mean? What could these numbers mean? I'll give you a moment to think about it. 714, 755, 762. Now, Molly told me that a number they of you said, are baseball fans. Yeah. Brody said home runs in their career. Brody is absolutely correct. Good job, Brody. Nicely done. Yeah, these are the home run totals for the three greatest home run hitters in the history of baseball. Babe Ruth had 714. He had the record. A lot of people thought it would never be broken. But they were wrong because Hank Aaron, a guy that I'm old enough to have seen play, he came around and he broke that record. And he finished his career with 755. So he became the new home run king. But his record was later broken by another player, Barry Bonds. And Bonds finished his career with 762 home runs. So he's the current home run king. And, you know, baseball fans like me, we're kind of funny. We memorize these records, these milestones. So when somebody says the number 714 to a baseball fan, he or she is very likely to think, oh, 714, I'm thinking of Babe Ruth's home run total. It's kind of a famous number in baseball. So the numbers really do have a significance. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to learn about a statistic that's called batting average. And batting average is one of many statistics that we use to measure how good a player is as a hitter. And he has a bat or she has a bat in their hands. So we have a formula for batting average, basically a fraction. We have the numerator is the number of hits for the player. And then we have the denominator, which is the number of at bats for the player. And I'd like everybody to write this formula down. It's a fraction again, hits are the numerator, at bats are the denominator. So it's hits over at bats. If you want to abbreviate, you can do that. H for hits, AB for at bats, but it's the same formula. Now, if we have this information, if we know the number of hits for a player and the number of at bats for the player, number of times they come up to the plate, we can then figure out that player's batting average. How do we do it? Take the number of hits, we divide it by the number of the bats. So we're going to try a practice problem here. I want everybody to try this. Suppose Jackie Robinson starts the season by collecting three hits in his first 10 at bats. What would his batting average be? So the first thing you want to do is you want to draw, or not draw, but uh, write down the fraction. And it is three over 10. 
So three is the numerator and 10 is the denominator. Three divided by 10. Then if you have a calculator, you can use that. If you don't, you can use pen and paper. We're gonna take the three, we're gonna divide it by 10. We're gonna come up with a decimal. And we need to figure out that decimal to three places. We need to figure it out to three places. And that's going to be the batting average for that player. So let's take a moment to work on that. Again, if you have calculators, feel free to use them. If not, use pencil and paper. Three divided by 10, what would the batting average come out to be? Someone has an answer, let your teacher know and we'll uh, see if you're correct. So we have, we have Brody says 0 0.3 or 0, 0, 0.3. Owen says 0 0.3 and Isaiah and Charlotte say 0 0.3. Okay, you're not incorrect. You've done your math correctly. It does come out to 0 0.3, but batting average has to be expressed with three digits. So we have to um, we have to kind of expand that 0 0.3. What do you think we add to the 0 0.3 to make it a three-digit decimal? Ah. Oh. The 0.3 is not incorrect, but as a batting average, we need to have three places, three digits. What are we going to add to the 0.3? Anybody know? What might we add to make it a three-digit batting average? Maybe the mums and dads. Oh, Brody says... 0 0.300. 0. Okay, so 0. 0.300. 0. So we start with the 0. 0.3 and then we add the two zeros and it becomes a 300 batting average. So let's go over this. Here's our fraction. Three hits over 10 at bats. When we divide three by 10, we do in fact come up with 0. 0.3. We then have to add, in this case, the two zeros to make it three digits. It becomes a batting average of 300. Now, when you are writing batting average down on paper or typing it, you always have to put the decimal first followed by the three numbers. So you have to write the decimal out. Decimal, then three numbers. However, in baseball, when we're just kind of talking baseball and I'm referring to someone's batting average, I don't have to say they're hitting 0.300. I just have to say they're hitting 300. We do have to write the decimal, but for batting average, we don't have to say it. How the word in baseball. So 300 would be the batting average. Let's try another practice problem. If Jackie Robinson had a 300 batting average, what percentage of the time did he get a hit? So we're going to take batting average, which is a decimal, and we are going to convert it into a percentage. Now, I don't even need a calculator to do this. There's something very basic I can do with that decimal point. What do I do with that decimal point to convert a decimal into a percentage. Um, Owen is saying 30% and Brody is saying 30%. Well, they are both right. 30% is correct. And the easy way to get there is you take that decimal point and you move it two places to the right. Not to the left, but two places to the right. So we start out. 300 batting average. It's written out as 0.300. Want to make it a percentage. We move the decimal 
two places to the right. It now becomes 30.0% or said more simply, 30%. So in other words, a hitter who has a 300 batting average, another way to express that is to say that that hitter is getting a hit 30% of the time. Now, I wonder, is that a good batting average, good percentage, or a bad percentage in baseball? Well, if you think about it, 30% on your math test would not be very good, right? You'd be a failure, unfortunately. Baseball, though, is a little different. Hitting a baseball is really hard to do. It's one of the hardest things to do in all of team sports. It's really, really difficult. Even though it sounds like a low number, 30% is actually good for a hitter. You know, if you're a professional player and you can get a hit 30% of the time, you've accomplished something good. So in baseball, 30% or a 300 average isn't very good. Let's try another practice problem. Here we have Hall of Famer Chipper Jones. He comes up seven times in a double header and collects two hits. By the way, for those who don't follow baseball, doubleheader is just two games in one day, okay? Um, so it's really not that important to solving this word problem. The key things, the seven times at bat, and the two hits. Now that we know that, what would Chipper Jones' batting average be? What would his batting average be? Two hits, seven at bats. You start by creating your fraction. You then divide numerator by denominator. And you need to figure it out to three places. So let's take a moment to work on that. Seven at bats, two hits. What's the batting average going to be? See who can come up with the correct answer. You guys are good at math. 2.86. Brody says 2.85. Okay. Now, is that 2.86 or 0.286? That's because I am not a math teacher. 0. Okay. 0.286. The decimal okay. is so before the two. Yes. 0.286. And just to remind ourselves, when we're saying the batting average, we don't have to say the decimal. We do have to write it. We can just say 286. Well, whoever said 286 is absolutely right. Let's go over this. So there's our fraction. Now, I gave you in the word problem, I gave you the at bats first. Sometimes people will see that and they'll make the fraction 7 over 2 don't do that. The numerator is always the hits, and the denominator is always the at-bats. That doesn't change. So the fraction's not 7 over 2, it's 2 over 7. We then divide 2 by 7, and when I use my calculator to do that, I get this really long number, 0.2857142. Now, the problem is now I've got too much information. I've got too many numbers here, and I have to reduce these seven numbers, these seven digits, down to three. How do I do that? Well, the way I do it is I look at the fourth number to the right of the decimal. So we've got the two, we've got the eight, we've got the five, we've got the seven. So seven is that fourth number coming after the decimal. I then ask myself, is that number less than five. If it is, then I don't change the first three digits. 285 is going to stay. That's going to be the batting average. But if the fourth number is five or greater, then I'm going to round up a point. So let's look at that number seven. Let's ask ourselves, is seven less than five? No. Is it five or greater? Yes. And if it's five or greater, we have to round up. So we're going to round up 285 by a point and make it 286. 
So that's what happens when you get more than three digits when you're doing your calculation. You've got to look at the fourth number, ask yourself that question, is the number less than five or is it five or greater? If it is five or greater, we round up by a point. So that's how we get to 286. All right, I want to tell you the story of this player, Ted Williams, Hall of Famer, great player for the Boston Red Sox. Some have called him the greatest pure hitter in the history of baseball. Going back to his 1941 season, Ted was having what some people say was his greatest year ever. Going into the final day of the season, his batting average looked something like this, 0.39955. All right, I've got too many numbers here. I've got five digits. I need to re reduce that down to three. So can someone help me out? I want to express this properly as a three-digit batting average. What would it be? Can someone tell me what it would be? 0.39955. Oh, they Remember, might. Remember, the number is going to tell us what to do. Brody says 400. Well, Brody is on a roll. You're absolutely right. The fourth number is a five. Is it five or greater? Yes. We round up. We add a point. So 399 does become 400. And 400 is considered a magical batting average. It's an incredible accomplishment. There's just one problem for Ted Williams. He still has two games to go in the 1941 season. There's a doubleheader on the final day of the year. But the manager of the Red Sox, Joe Cronin, goes up to Ted. He says, Ted, these last two games are pretty meaningless. We've already been eliminated in the pennant race. We're not going to the World Series this year. So if you'd like to make sure that your batting average doesn't fall below 400, you could sit out these last two games. That would be just fine by me. Before I tell you what Ted responded, what he said to his manager, let's learn a little bit more about Ted. Later in his life, he served in two major wars. World War II, and then the Korean War. This is a famous photograph of him during the Korean War in the early 1950s. He's a fighter pilot, very dangerous job. One time his engine was shot up, didn't work anymore. He had to make an emergency landing in a field. Luckily, because of his great skill as a pilot, he survived even though he did suffer some minor injuries. So you get the sense, you know, being a fighter pilot in the war, Ted is a pretty courageous, pretty brave guy. Now that you know that, what do you think? Could he take the safe way out and not play those last two games? Or do you think he played? Brody think thinks he played, raise your hands, and let the teacher know. Who thinks he played those last two games? Brody thinks he played. Isaiah thinks he played. Okay. Aiden, Anybody uh, else agree with them? Owen and Aiden think he played. Okay. So it sounds like a number of you think he played, and you are correct. And here's how we did in that doubleheader. First game, he got four hits and five at bats. Second game, he picked up two hits in three at-bats. Here's what I'd like you all to do. Figure out what was, what was his batting average for the double header. What was his batting average for the double header? Now, I'm going to give you a little hint on this. Before you create your fraction, you want to add up some numbers. Look at the four and the two on the left side. That's, that's your hits column. You want to add those together. And then you got the five and the three on the right side. That's your at-bats column. You want to add those together. Once you've added those together, you'll have your fraction. Then you can divide, and then you can come up with a batting average.
So we're going to add the 4 and the 2. We're going to add the 5 and the 3. Come up with a fraction and then divide. So Brody and Owen and Charlotte and Isaiah all say either 75% or 750. Well, they are all correct. Absolutely. Let's do this step by step here. Our fraction is going to be 6 over 8. We added the 4 and the 2, the hits column, so that's 6 hits. We added the 5 and the 3 together, and that's the at-bats. That is 8 at-bats. So that is our fraction, 6 over 8. When you divide 6 by 8, you get 0.75. However, 0.75 is not a batting average. You need three digits. So I've got to add a 0. 0.75 becomes 0 0.750. I write the decimal, write the three numbers after it. I can say that as a 750 batting average. Now, with that 750 batting average, I wonder, does Ted Williams' season average of 400 go up or does it go down? Well, it's got to go up because 750 is greater than 400. And because of that, it's going to push that 400 average all the way up to 406. So Ted Williams, not only did he hit 400 in 1941, he did it with six percentage points to spare, 406. This was 79 years ago. You know how many hitters in the major leagues have hit 400 since then? Zero. No one has done it. That's how hard it is to do. No one has hit 400 for a full season in nearly 80 years. So that's an incredible accomplishment by Ted Williams. All right, we're going to play some home run derby. Um, I don't know if um, you're able to divide um, the students into two teams. If we can, we'd like to have a blue team and a red team, and they'll take turns trying to answer questions. How many students do we have total? Families, so um, let's see. Can we put Charlotte and Isaiah with Brody and Owen and Aiden with Maddie and Dawson? Okay. Okay, sure. Okay. All right. So um, Charlotte's team is going to be the blue team. They're going to be the visiting team. They're going to bat first. And then Owen, I think that was the name you mentioned. I think Owen will be the captain of the red team. They will be the home team and they'll bat second. So we're going to start with the blue team. Why don't we start with Charlotte? And if Charlotte's family wants to help her out, that's fine. Um, before we get into uh, batting average, we're going to do some kind of warm-up questions here. So here you go, Charlotte. Now, Charlotte is going to verbally give the teacher an answer, but everybody should work on this at their home. For many years, Babe Ruth held the record for most home runs. His record was finally broken in 1974 by another great player, Hank Aaron. Ruth hit 714 home runs, but Aaron ended up with 41 more than that. So how many home runs did Hank Aaron hit for his career? So this is not a batting average question. We're going to use basic addition to give us an answer. And Charlotte, leadoff batter for the Blues, will try to give us that right answer. Hey, Charlotte, you can have uh, 700, they say 755. Absolutely correct. Very good, Charlotte. We take the 714 Ruth's total. We add the 41 more that Aaron hit beyond that, and we do come up with 755 home runs, and that was the record that stood until it was broken by Barry Bond. So well done, Charlotte. Blues take a one nothing lead. Now, red team, we're going to start with Owen on this one. 
Again, not a batting average question. This time we're going to use some subtraction. The National Baseball Hall of Fame officially opened its doors in 1939. In 2009, uh, 2019, I should say, the Hall of Fame celebrated a special anniversary. How many years old did the Hall of Fame turn in 2019? So Owen's going to work on this. Everybody at their home should work on it as well. How many years old did the Hall of Fame turn in 2019? Uh, Owen says 80. And Owen is right. So we take 2019, we subtract 1,939. And yes, we do come up with 80. The Hall of Fame turned 80 in 2019. Well done, Owen. Home run for the Reds. So we are tied one to one. Now, second inning, we go back to the blue team. And I think we have Isaiah who's going to bat next. Here you go, Isaiah. Hall of Famer Mickey Mantle was a famed center fielder for the Yankees. He hit with tremendous power. He was also a very fast runner in the outfield and on the bases until knee injuries slowed him down. In the 1955 All-Star Game, Mantle had two hits and six at-bats. What was his batting average in that game? Ooh. So this is Isaiah, two hits, six at bats. So that's going to give us our fraction. We then divide hits by at bats. We try to come up with a three digit batting average. And Isaiah, mom and dad can help you with this. Mom will help Isaiah. Good. Thanks, mom. So Isaiah says three, three, three. Okay. So 333, is that correct? Of course it is. Good job, Isaiah. We take the two hits, we divide by the six at bats. Now, if you're using a calculator, you're gonna just see threes across your screen. Point three, 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 just gonna keep going. So we got more than three digits, right? What's the fourth number after the decimal? It's gotta be a three. They're all threes, right? We ask ourselves, that number less than five? And yeah, three is less than five. So that means we're not rounding up. We're just going to round back to the same number. 333 is going to stay exactly the way it is. So good job, Isaiah. You are correct. Blues take a two to one lead. All right. Who do we have next for the red team? Who's up after Owen? Um, Dawson. All right, Dawson. Now that's a great name. There's a Hall of Famer named Andre Dawson. It's his last name, but it's your first name, obviously. So Dawson, here we go. 1967, an incredible season for Carl Yastrzemski. He won the Triple Crown by leading the American League in batting average, home runs, and RBIs. He was also voted the most valuable player he led the Red Sox to the pennant. In the 1967 All-Star Game, Yastrzemski had three hits and four at-bats. What was his batting average in the All-Star Game? Three hits and four at-bats. What was his batting average in the All-Star Game? Everybody should try to work on this. Dawson is going to give us the answer. Let's see if Dawson is still here. Or maybe one of his teammates might want to help him out. Do you want to say the answer? Sure, Brody. Um, you guys can say the answer. Um, Dawson's not here anymore. 
Oh, Dawson said it. I didn't hear Dawson. Oh, uh, 750. Okay, so that's Dawson's answer, and that is correct. So our fraction is three over four. When we divide three by four, we get 0.75. We've got to add a third number, so the batting average has to have three digits, so 0.75 equals 0.750. Write it with a decimal, but we say it as a 750 average. All right, good job, Dawson. Home run for the Reds. We are tied at two. Okay, right, and let's go back to the blue. I'm Sharp, sorry. Can I say I would like to know the last name of that baseball player again, whose first name was Dawson. Uh, no, his last name is Dawson. Oh, okay. First name, Andre. Andre. Andre Dawson, outfielder. And he was voted into the Hall of Fame, I'm going to say about 10, 12 years ago. Maybe a little more. Andre Dawson. Uh, used to play for the Montreal Expos, by the way. That's where he had his best season at the beginning of his career. All right, we're back to the blue team. And I think we have at least one more player there. Brody, it's your turn. Suppose Yankee star Aaron Judge goes four for five in the first game of a doubleheader. What would his batting average be? Four for five in the first game of a doubleheader. What is the batting average? Four hits in five at bats. Brody says 800. And Brody is correct. Four divided by five is 0.8. You then add the two zeros, it becomes an 800 batting average. Good job, Brody. Blues are now three for three in home run derby. Uh, who do we have left on the red team that hasn't gone yet? Um, Aiden. All right, here we go, Aiden. April 19, 2019, All-Star outfielder Bryce Harper had five hits against the Colorado Rockies. The five hits came in seven at-bats. What was Harper's batting average for the game? Five hits, seven at-bats. What's the batting average? Oh, I can hear the wheels turning in Aiden's head. <laughs> or maybe Owen can give him a bit of a hand. Bryce Harper used to play for the Washington Nationals. Then he joined the Philadelphia Phillies as a free agent. Not the greatest timing, though, because he left the Nationals just before they were going to win the World Series. Yeah, Brody's figured it out. He's a good player. Brody's on the other team. I know. But he has, didn't put yeah. the uh, We're waiting for Owen and Aiden. I think they're figuring it out. Owen and Aiden said 700. 700? Yeah. Make you guys sure about that. Oh, seven, four, oh, Dawson jumped in. Who's on their team? 714. All right, Dawson is going to give a revised answer. So he's going to give an assist to Aiden. And Dawson is right. Five divided by seven 
comes out to 0.71428. So we have to look. Fourth number after the decimal is the number two. Ask ourselves, is that number five or greater? It's not. It's less than five. So we don't round up to 715. We just round right back to 714. All right, so with an assist from Dawson, home run for the Reds. Now that number 714, that rings a bell. Didn't we talk about that number earlier? What's the significance of 714? Anybody remember? Ooh, I remember. Wasn't it someone's home run total? Brody says Babe Ruth's home run total. Yeah, that's right. The difference, though, is that 714 is a whole number. It doesn't have a decimal in front of it. This uh, number, this batting average, is a decimal. It does have the decimal four before the, uh, uh, the three digits. So the Babe Ruth home run total is the whole number 714. Bryce Harper's batting average, 0.714. All right, is there anybody who has not had a turn yet? Has everyone had a turn? Oh, Maddie hasn't had a turn. Okay. Um, is Maddie the last player? Yeah, but I think she's um, she could be an independent because um, the teams were pretty equal. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, that's all right. We'll get Maddie's Maddie batting shot. for connected north. All right. So Maddie's going to be on a third team. And uh, we'll see if this will be a, a three-run homer if Maddie can come up with it correct to tie the game. Hall of Fame slugger Willie Stargell was a leader of the Pittsburgh Pirates both on and off the field. In 1979, he shared the season's most valuable player award, for repeating his MVP in the playoffs and World Series. In the 1979 World Series, Stargell had 12 hits in 30 at bats. What was his batting average? Ooh, Maddie. Might help if Maddie has a calculator here. 12 hits, 30 at bats, what would the batting average be? Oh, Brody's willing to help. Maddie said 400. Well, Maddie, you are right. Nicely done. 12 divided by 30 comes out to 0.4. We add the two zeros to make it a three-digit batting average, so it's a 400 average. Remember we talked earlier about that magical batting average, 400 or better, very hard to do. Uh, this, of course, happened in fewer at-bats, but still pretty impressive. It's in the World Series. So you're right, Maddie, 400 was the average for Willie Stargell in the World Series. So that's a three-run home run, and we have a tie between the Blues, the Reds, and Team Maddie, each with three runs. All right, so everybody's had a chance. Does anyone have any questions for me? Okay, boys and girls, this is your opportunity to ask anything for Bruce for three minutes. Any questions at all? About baseball. Oh, why do teams play double headers from Charlotte and Isaiah? That's a great question. Um, they don't play as many double headers today. What they used to do in baseball, a lot of times, Sundays would be double headers. And fans would come out to the ballpark. They would only have to buy one ticket, and it would be good for two games. 
So it was kind of a, um, it was kind of a gift to the fans. It was kind of a bonus to fans for coming out on a Sunday. Um, baseball though has kind of gotten away from that. They rarely schedule double headers anymore because they do take a long time. You know, a game is at least you know today pretty much three hours or more. So if you're going to play two games, that's six hours. Takes a long time. Also, the teams, they don't like to give two games for the price of one. So when they do have doubleheaders today, which they're pretty rare, uh, they usually make you buy a, two tickets for each game uh, or a ticket for each game. So let's say you have a, a doubleheader. You might have one game in the afternoon, and then you have one game at night, and you have to have a ticket for each game. So wow, it changed a little bit over time. Yeah. Dawson would like to know, what is your favorite thing about your town except the Hall of Fame? That's a great question. Favorite thing about uh, Cooperstown? Well, I'll tell you, one of the things is the lake, which we showed you earlier, beautiful lake. We have a state park up at the northern end. Uh, we have a smaller beach on the west side of the lake. It's beautiful driving on both sides. Uh, it's really picturesque. Um, certain places that you can swim, fish, people go boating. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that I like. I like being in a small town. I grew up in a small town, so I kind of like that as well. But I think the lake, Lake Otsego, is pretty darn good here in Cooperstown. Nice. And Maddie wants to know, have you ever caught a baseball when you went to a game? Never have. Been to a few games over the years, but never been lucky enough to catch a ball. Um, I had some come close. That's why I always tell fans, if you go to a game and you're sitting close to the infield, you want to have a glove there. Um, good to protect yourself, but also you might have a better chance of catching it if you've got a glove on your hand. And my mom did. Never caught, never caught a foul ball at a game. My mom did on her 86th birthday. Oh, wow. My kids were there and she, and you know, they were, they helped her. It was very lucky. My mom's a really lucky person. Um, right. Jose and Charlotte would like to know what is your favorite field? Their mom really likes the progressive field in Cleveland. I've actually been there. It's, it, it is a really nice ballpark. Um, I would say of all the stadiums I've been to, the my favorite is it, it's a stadium that doesn't exist anymore. It was the original Yankee Stadium. My father and I went to one of the final games there in 1973 um, before they did a renovation. And now they, they have a completely new stadium down there. Um, but the original Yankee Stadium, I, I really like that one. That was, There's a lot of history there. That was where Babe Ruth played, Lou Gehrig, Mickey Mantle, so many great players. So my favorite stadium is a, is a ballpark that doesn't exist anymore. Okay, that's really, that's really neat. And I bet you there's parts of it at the Baseball Hall of Fame. We do have parts of the original Yankee Stadium. Yeah, yeah that's true. And this will be our last question, to actually two last questions, something we were discussing before you came in. Maddie wants to know what is your favorite team? And we want to know if the rumor is true that they may be starting up baseball in July. All right, I'll ta tackle the first question. Um, my favorite team was the Yankees. Now, my father was a Mets fan, and he, he was a big baseball fan. And that's why I became a baseball fan. But I kind of rebelled a little bit. He liked the Mets, so I decided to pick the other team in New York, the Yankees. I grew up in Westchester County, which is a suburb of New York City. So the Yankees have always been my favorite team, though I do like the Pittsburgh Pirates and Oakland A's as well. Um, as far as the rumor of baseball starting up, uh, it's a possibility. The major league owners earlier this week submitted a plan to the players. Um, they're probably going to have to negotiate, go back and forth on some of the terms of this plan. Um, but if the two sides can come to an agreement, it looks like we could have a season starting early July. Um, but it does depend on the two sides coming to an agreement. Uh, they haven't done that yet. We'll see if they can. 
Well, we hope they will because we know baseball is a favorite sport in the United States and Canada. And we're really thank this was really fun. I always like this session because it makes the students think a little bit and we learn a lot about baseball and um, why it's so important to our culture, uh, you know, the culture in North America and to see some really interesting parts of um, a place that we can't visit really easily. So we have Bruce coming back in a couple of weeks to talk about geometry and it is so cool to think about all the geometry in baseball and on the fields. So thanks everyone for playing. We're glad that you were here. We hope to see you at the farm animal session in just a few minutes. And thanks Bruce as always, enjoy your day and um, hope everything is great in Cooperstown. Bye-bye.